So as I said in the previous video, in this video I really want to look at getting that physical node added to my OpenShift cluster so that I can start deploying some virtual machines on there. So it was really an uneventful process. I went ahead and did it to make sure there was no challenges and I would be able to articulate those problems in a video, but there was really no challenges apart from one that I run into. It was basically just boot from Fedora Core OS and then run the Core OS installer just like any other worker node. So basically what I did was I took all the disks in the, in the server, put them into one RAID volume, so it all shows up as SDA. Um, there's three and a half terabytes of storage available to the node now. And then I just did the Core OS installer. The only issue I did run into was with UEFI and booting from the live USB stick. So I just I DD'd the image to a USB drive, chucked it in the front of the server, booted it up, and I ended up just on a grub prompt. Now this is a problem that has been fixed in the latest version of Fedora Core OS, but at least in the version that I was using as of March 2022, that it was still a problem. So if you're using the same version that I am, you are likely to hit it. So I thought I would just quickly cover that and then basically just show you what it looks like once that physical node has been added. So I've reproduced the error in a virtual machine and I'll walk through it on that virtual machine. So here we can see that this VM is now booted up and I've landed at the Grub prompt. Now this is what I was seeing from my server. So basically to fix this and get the node booted, we just do a quick LS. We can see all the petitions and we want to locate the, the root petition, the one that has all of the Grub uh, config file located on it. So we do LS HD0 for example, forward slash. It's not a file system, so we check in each of the petitions. GPT-1, nothing, 2. Okay, so here we see on GPT-2 we have an EFI petition. And if we look in the EFI petition, we have Fedora, and in Fedora we have this grub CFG file. So what we want to do is do set root equal to HD0 GPT-2, and then config file, we use root forward slash EFI Fedora grub.cfg. And then we press enter and that's all that was necessary for me to get my server to boot from that. And then once the node was booted it was just a matter of doing the CoreOS installer as we did in the previous video. So having done that I would now have this node added into my OpenShift cluster. So we go to compute and nodes we can see that I have this node here and I've given it the label CNB. So I want to be able to schedule workloads specifically on this node and not target them at workers, for example. I want them to run specifically on a CNV node. Now that comes in useful, for example, when we need to apply configuration that only applies to this node, or when we do updates, that node updates separately. For example, if we look here, we can see that the CNV nodes were updated separately to the worker and the master nodes. So, the next thing we needed to do is we need to add some storage for the local file system provisioner, which is part of the operator install. If we have a look at the operator, the kubevert, we can see that it has a host path provisioner. So in the host path provisioner deployment, we point to bar SRV storage on the node and we specifically target our new node. Now we could have used the label there for CNV. In this case, I've just used the host name node. So the thing that we need to do at this point is we need to actually configure that file system because that doesn't exist by default. And the way we do that in Core OS is using ignition files. And the way we do that in OpenShift is via machine config. So we take a look at our machine configs. We can see here these are all the machine configs that are created for our nodes in the environment. Now what happens is these get consolidated and added to a rendered file. That rendered file is the ignition file that the node boots from. So when we want to make changes, we can create a new machine config file with those relevant changes. So here, for example, I've created this 50 CMB local storage. Now we take a look at the YAML for this file. We can see what I've done is I've added a systemd unit, and that unit is creating a mount point for bar SRV storage. So what it does when it runs is it executes make directory with the dash p option, which means if var server doesn't exist, make sure you make that as well. And then we create var server storage. Now we make sure that is enabled and we give it a name. The next thing we want to do is we want to make sure that the um, SE Linux context on that directory are set correctly. So again, we create another systemd file. 
And in this one, we're going to make sure it boots before kubelet. We don't want kubelet to start before this service. We want the file system to be all set up before it tries to schedule any pods or any of our uh, VMs on this node. And then we're going to execute chcon, uh, capital R, so recursive, T, we're going to give it the context of container file T on var server storage. Now, once you do this, make sure you set it to enabled. That's going to reboot the node from the rendered version of the file. So this is it here. And you can see this contains all of the things that are relevant for our server, for our, our worker nodes, and also for CNB. And it's going to make sure that that runs on the next boot. That will give us our storage for the host path provision on. So we just created a machine config pool to add specifically that node to so that that config gets picked up by the right node. So we look at the YAML file for this one. So what we do in here is we match on any of the machine configs that match the value worker or CMV. So we're applying all the settings for our worker nodes because it is just an OpenShift worker node. But we also want to apply things that are relevant only for CMV nodes. So this means we still get all of our SSH keys, we get all of the other things like the registries and all those things that are configured on the node, but we also get this 50 CNB local storage machine config that we've applied. Now this machine config pool applies to the node selector that matches node role Kubernetes CNB. So that's the label we looked at on the node specifically. So once we've created the machine config pool and the machine config, it will match on that node the node will then reboot from its rendered ignition file and apply those settings. So looking at the file I used to create the machine config pool, it's very, very basic. We can see here that I add in the machine config selector and I match on those expressions, worker and CNV, and then I match on the node selector using the match labels and the uh, node role of CNV. Let me just do OC apply dash F on that machine config pool. For the machine config itself, as I said, we created that 50 CMV local storage machine config, and that's what it looks like there. So I'll make sure there's links to these below so that you can copy them if you need to. So again, we just use that match on the machine config role of CMV so that we're only matching our CMV machine config pool. We're not trying to match on the workers in this case. And then we just do OC apply on that file as well. So once we've got both of them applied, we can basically watch the status of the machine config pool until the node has been rebooted and had that config applied. And we can see here that it says updated true, updating is false, paused false, degraded false. That's what it should look like once it's finished. And then looking at the nodes, if we look at this node, this one will now have annotations that This one will now have annotations saying that it has applied that rendered machine config from the rendered CNV machine config instead of rendered worker. Once that's done, then we can proceed with configuring our operators. So we look at the operators. As I said, we want to configure this host path provisioner. So the host path provisioner, you can go through and just create using the form through the OpenShift console or you can just use the YAML file. In my case, I just used the YAML file because all I needed to do was add this information here. So it was super simple to set up. So I just added the path that I want to use for my local storage for the nodes. This is where all the disks for my virtual machines will be installed. Once the host path provisioner is set up, we can configure the hyper-converged cluster operator deployment. So we look in here, again, we can go through and answer the questions on the form, or we can just use the um, YAML file as well here. So we go through and we add in, for example, I added the with host path pass through CPU uh, feature gate because I want to pass through the CPU of the host into a couple of the um, compute node VMs that will deploy for OpenStack. And then again, just with the node placement, I only want this to apply to my OCP worker 3 node, which is my bare metal node in the environment. Once that's configured, the next thing we need is some networks. We really need to define what the networks in the environment are going to look like so that we can provision nodes. So we do that using some, some CRD objects within OpenShift, and we're gonna take a look at those. So we have a look at the network config policy. We can see here that I'm setting up a bond. So I wanna set up this bond. Again, we're matching on the host name, OCP Worker 3. 
And now for this bond, I'm going to add in my ENO2 and ENO3 interfaces on the node. I'm going to set it up using the LACP um, standard, so 802.3 AD. And we're going to make sure it's enabled and set it to get DHCP addresses. So again, we just do OC apply on that one. So once our bond is set up, we want to set up a bridge so that we can bridge our VMs to it. So we've created a bridge using the NNCP as well. And we can see here that we're creating a Linux bridge and we're setting it up to bridge the bond zero interface that we just created. Now here I've used a node selector that matches on the role instead of the host name to show the difference between the, what that looks like. So these are the network config policies. You can see one's degraded there, I'm not 100% sure why. It's here. So apparently that one's failing. I'll have to I'll have to look into that, but it's working, so it mustn't be too bad. So that failing one, if we want to see why that's failing, let's let's troubleshoot while we're while we're here. Get an NCE-show YAML and we'll have a look at that one. So we can see here that we have an error that says interface bond zero is a port of a Linux bridge interface, BR1, and it's not allowed to have an IPv4 address. So let's just quickly fix that. So we get rid of the IPv4 stuff. We see apply dash f that file. So now we have updated it. We see get an NCE. We can see that it's now progressing. So that's the problem fixed with the NNCE now. So that's all good. So we can we can move on with the rest of the video. Let's take a look at how we can figure some network attachment policies now. So the next thing we want to do is create a network attachment uh, definition. So we can see here, for example, I've created one for VLAN 1. And in here we can see that I'm giving it a name of VLAN 1 bridge, VLAN 1 bridge, and we're creating a bridge called BR1 on the VLAN 1 in this case. And that will give my VMs access to VLAN 1 if I choose to use that bridge. The other one I've created is a trunk. So what we're doing here is just setting up a bridge to bridge that bond and that will give my VMs access to the trunk port and I'll be able to create network interfaces on any of the VLANs so that I can do the tagging within the VMs which is the way I want OpenStack set up so it just looks like they're plugged into trunk ports. So once those have been set up we can go to our virtualization tab, have a look at virtual machines and then we can create a VM. So we can create a VM using the wizard so in my case, I've created a CentOS 9 stream, which I actually called CentOS 8 stream image. Then we click next, we go through and call it test CentOS 9. We've got flavors here, so we can customize this in a minute. It doesn't have to match on that. We can expose SSH access, which creates a service that you can SSH to, which is pretty cool. We can set up the authorized key that we're going to provide to that virtual machine. And then if we click customize virtual machine and go to networking, we can see here what the networking looks like. So NIC1 is going to bridge our pod networking network and NIC2 I'm going to plug in the trunk bridge. Now we can go through and add in any of those networks that we set up. So for example, we've got the VLAN1 bridge that we spoke about before. If I only want it on VLAN1, I can attach it just simply to that interface. And I'm going to set it up as a bridge type. Storage. Storage is going to use the host path provisioner to provision that storage for us, which uses the storage class that we'll look at. On the advanced tab, we can set up a username and password for the node, and then we can review all the settings that are going to apply and click create virtual machine. So the final thing that we have set up is a host path storage class. So that host path storage class just looks like this where we point it to a provisioner called the host path provisioner that we've already configured. And that basically creates a storage class that will listen for persistent volume and persistent volume claim requests for storage. And then we respond to those storage claims as they come in from that VM creation. So if we do OC get PV PVC, we can see that I have these PVCs that are dynamically created when I create those virtual machines. 
in the case of the controller node and the compute node, I've added in a second disk, which we can see here. That goes through and then creates the persistent volume claim, which is here, and that gets attached to the PV that's been created. So this is obviously a lot to take in. This gives you a, a summary of how this all comes together, but it's obviously a lot to wrap your head around if you're coming from something, something like Overt, where it was all very point and clicky through the web UI. This requires some things to be set up in advance. So if the command line is not for you, it's also possible to create those network attachment definitions through the web UI. But I found that it's definitely easier to create the bond and the bridge using the command line and those YAML files. And it also means I can push them to a Git repo. So if I ever need to rebuild this cluster, I have those YAML files available. So if you want to do it through the web UI, you would go create network attachment, we'll call it VLAN4. We're going to create a CNV bridge. The bridge will be BR1. As we saw, that's the bridge we created on the node. And the VLAN tag for this one will be four in this case. So then we have a new network definition for VLAN4. And now I can attach my virtual machines to that network as well if I like. And that will give me access to VLAN4. Now the, the storage can seem a little bit complex as well since we have to create up set up that storage provisioner, but that makes it a lot easier for you when you create those virtual machines. You don't need to worry about the storage on the back end. You know that it's going to have storage on the local hypervisor that is just going to sort itself out in the back end and you don't need to worry about it. So we look at the storage classes here, we can see our host path provisioner that we created and we can see the persistent volume claims that are being dynamically created as I spin up those virtual machines. Now you can see here it has access to the full storage of that node, the 3.27 terabytes that the node has access to. So I don't want to go too crazy in this video. There's already a lot to wrap our heads around as it is. I think in, I think this might warrant going over each of these details individually and having a look at how each of them work, kind of like we did for the uh, ingress class, the ingress to route ingress class in the previous video. Uh, just from a high level, you know, I just wanted to really touch on the different components that make this up. And there's some really good resources on the Kubevert website as well as within the OKD documentation itself. So you can see here, this is exactly what we did. You know, we created one with CMV and we matched on that label. So we basically just copied everything from here and tried to keep it as simple as possible and as achievable as possible for everyone. It's also touched on labeling the node, for example. So I'll leave the links to all of this below. In the next video in this Home Lab series, I wanna look at redeploying triple O on those virtual machines that we've created now. So we have a director, we've got our compute and controller nodes. So we'll run a deployment against those nodes and see if we can get triple O up and running all virtualized running on CNV. We'll also be taking a look at the OSP director operator and trying to get an environment spun up with that. And for this particular environment, I've also gone ahead and used the mirror registry, which I'll leave a link to below. So I'm gonna make a video touching on how to use the mirror registry because it's actually really cool and gives you access to a cut down version of Quay, for example. So we have a look here. We can see that I've mirrored all of the OKD um, images. So 4.10 was just released today, actually, and I've already updated this cluster to 4.10. So we can see here, oh, well, it's in the middle of an update. So we'll take a look at that in an upcoming video as well. So just a nice quick one covering how to add that physical node. As I said, it was a super simple process with the exception of that grub prompt that I got. If you run into it, hopefully I've answered how to fix that problem. And I'll leave all the links to all the other steps that were required to get um, CNV environment up and running and deploying virtual machines. I'm happy to take questions below. If there's anything you want covered in more detail, I'm also happy to do that. Just drop it in a comment below and we'll look at anything you want to look at in more detail.